Okay, so for everyone who's just joining, um, while we just wait for everybody to get in, uh, you'll see that there is a Menti link uh, on the slide up at the top um, with a code that you can put in. So feel free to jump on that Mentimeter link um, and start sharing your views and opinions already. That would be really great. Um, what we're going to do throughout the session is we're going to use Menti to have some audience participation as well as having some more interactive conversation towards the end. So we want to hear from you what your views and perspectives are already and we can start responding to those um, as we open the session. So please do use that Mentimeter link um, it's at the top of the page and get sharing. Brilliant. So I think we have quite a lot of people now and I know time is short, so we're going to make a start um, and then hopefully, you know, as additional people join, uh, we can bring them up to speed on our discussions. I know for some people it's very early, for some people it's a little bit later in the day. Um, so we will have a slow start and just make sure that everybody's able to join us on the way. So first of all, I want to welcome you to this event. Um, on making the SDGs work for adolescents and young people. This session has been co-organised by the major group for children and youth, NGCY, by the Yield Hub, by Girl Effect, by FIA Foundation, and by PMNCH, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, in support of the upcoming Global Forum for Adolescents and the 1.8 Billion Young People for Change campaign. We know many of you are here and following along with the Ecosoc Youth Forum. Some of you may be in New York in person, some of you may be joining online. And we hope that this session will also help ground some of the conversations that are happening there, intangible ideas and perspectives and next steps on how we can really center the voices of young people. I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping just so that we're all on the same page um, and you know how to listen and interact with the session. So firstly, we have interpretation available for this session. Um, we have French, we have Spanish, and we have international sign language. So if you do want to join any of those channels and listen in your own language um, or follow sign language interpretation, you should be able to select those choices um, from the Zoom room. And if you have any problems, feel free to join um, and just ask a question in the chat. And we have colleagues here who will be able to direct you um, to how best you can, you can join those. Um, and then the other point for housekeeping is just that we will try to make this as participatory as possible, but we appreciate we only have an hour together. So please do connect to Mentimeter links that we're going to share in order to participate um, and share your views. We hope that this will make it really more of an interactive session amongst all of us. We're really excited that this event also marks uh, the launch of a new report uh, with Girl Effect and Fear Foundation, who are launching a new report today on the role of transport services in supporting access to sexual and reproductive health services for adolescent girls and young women with findings from different African countries. And this is important because it's a really great illustration of how different elements have come together to make the SDGs work for adolescents and young people. Um, you know, you may be an SRHR youth activist, you may work on other issues, but actually the different um, aspects of our environment, the world we're living in, all interconnect with each other and determine whether we're able to claim our well-being, our health, our rights. So we're really excited to hear a little bit more about this today. Um, and to hear from, you know, I guess all our different speakers today on why and how it's important to involve young people in identifying barriers, but also in addressing them. And then finally, just as a really good kickstarter for this conversation, I also wanted to highlight that last week, the UN Secretary General launched his new policy brief on meaningful youth engagement, which is a big UN document intended to kickstart the conversation on how we can create more space for youth voices and decision making at all levels. Today's conversation will hopefully build on this and really reflect on how we can center the voices and agency of adolescents in sustainable development. 
So before we go to David Zimbago, who's chair of the PMNCH Adolescents and Youth Constituency, as well as manager at Yield Hub, I'd like to show you all the trailer for the Global Forum on Adolescents and the 1.8 billion Young People for Change campaign. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's not my first time hearing that video and it always makes me want to get up and dance a little bit. Um, and hopefully sets a tone for the exciting conversation we're going to have, um, which really reflects on the energy of adolescents and young people uh, and our voices for change. So I'm going to pass now to David uh, Embargo, who is the manager of the Yield Hub to introduce a little bit more um, about the Global Forum for Adolescents and the 1.8 campaign. But while we do that, you know, I wanted to warm you up a little bit for some interaction. Um, I know we're all very used to Zoom calls and it's hard to stay engaged. So we've got a Mentimeter poll. Um, you may have seen this as you joined this morning, um, came into the call, but we would like you to go on that Mentimeter link um, and start to share your thoughts on the question, what will it take to make the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, work for adolescents and young people? Um, and I think one of my colleagues is going to share that mental slide um, right now so you can start engaging. But on that note, over to you, Debbie, to introduce more about the Global Forum and the 1.8 campaign. Thank you so much, Lucy, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this uh, side event on the silence of the EcoSoc Youth Forum. As Lucy mentioned, yes, my name is David Imbago. I am the chair of the Adolescents and Youth Constituency of PMNCH, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, which is hosted by the World Health Organization. This is the world's largest alliance working to improve the health and well being of women, children, and adolescents. Besides this, I am also the manager of the Yield Hub, an independent initiative on SRHR for young people hosted by Rutgers International. I am very, very happy to be part of this session and excited to hear about the upcoming conversations. And first, I wanted to give you some background on why 1.8, because you may have seen on the title that is 1.8 young people uh, for change. What is this? Today, the world has more young people than ever before, yet far too many of the 1.8 billion adolescents and young people between the ages of 10 and 24 are underserved by current policies and levels of financing. On top of this issue that was already happening uh, a few years ago, the pandemic also had a significant impact and effect on the lives and livelihoods of young people around the world. They have been affected by school closures, job losses, and disruptions to their social lives. Mental health is also a major issue that has not been properly addressed, and also will mean in general, going beyond health and talking about education, employability, agency, and so on, is something that is left behind in the agenda uh, related to health. For example, just to give you a, a figure and, and, and a rate right now, in low and middle income countries, it is estimated that 10 to the, the 10, 20, uh, sorry, that 70 percent of 10 years old are unable to read simple texts, which is unbelievable. It's something that we are losing progress on in terms of education, and it's something that is simply uh, is simply unfair at this point. A significant increase was seen due to the pandemic in this case. Therefore, accelerating the COVID-19 recovery and full implementation of the 2030 agenda on SDGs uh, for youth is important because it addresses the immediate needs of young people in the wake of the pandemic, ensures that their voice and perspective is included in the efforts to achieve the SDGs, and also empowers them to create a better future for all. To ensure that youth are, the, are at the forefront of change and leading to the way 
uh, to achieve the 2030 agenda. In October of 2022, last year, PMNCH lost the one, launched the 1.8 billion young people for change campaign. Uh, this is a multi-year advocacy campaign for adolescents' well-being that seeks to increase attention for adolescents and youth issue, and this leads up to the UN Summit of the Future in 2024. Now, besides the, the campaign, we also have the Global Forum for Adolescents, which will take place this year in October 11 and 12, and this will be a major milestone in this effort of the 1.8 Young People uh, for Change campaign. This forum is a massive virtual platform at which partners from all around the world uh, can share evidence, engage partners, and specifically engage with young people. Uh, this will spark a multi-sectoral action for promoting political and financial commitments for adolescent well-being. And this forum will also feature a series of national events on a two-day virtual global program. Besides the virtual uh, space that we're going to create, we also estimate that 1 million people will be engaged in a massive digital advocacy effort to drive global change, creating a massive civic movement for, by, and with this important population group. At the same time, on top of this that I already mentioned, uh, simultaneously in over 100 countries around the world, PMNCH partners will activate a vibrant and innovative set of discussions, activities, and events that will happen at the local level. And this will link to a virtual uh, stage uh, digital advocacy hub and shared uh, through this online tool. We expect that new knowledge, data, evidence, and innovations will be shared uh, during this, uh, this event among PMNCH constituency and partners, including the private sector, UN agencies, parliamentarians, academics, donors, media, and NGOs, as well, of course, as young people themselves who are involved in this uh, initiative. At the center of this effort, there's young people themselves who are speaking for their own health and well-being, their empowerment and resilience, their education and skills, and their connection with people and the planet even. The campaign is not just for young people, but it's also by young people. It is completely led by young people. And I encourage you to uh, check the website www.1.8.org, where you can find various opportunities for engagement, including commitment mobilization, gathering perspectives of young people through the What Young, what young People Want initiative, social media engagement, among others. We will also post the five ways to, to engage in the campaign in the chat as well. So look for, for that message on the, on the chat. I remember your voice is not critical in this campaign. It is essential. Change makers like yourselves are forced to reckon with and, and the campaign is yours to advocate for issues that you feel most strongly about it. So log onto the website and explore ways you can engage with us. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. The details will also be on the chat. Please use the hashtag 1.8 uh hashtag while posting about this event today and also feel free to share what is most important for your well-being so that others uh other young people can learn from that experience and work on this too with that i wish you a great event and good luck today thank you so much and over to you lucy great thank you so much david and throughout the session you'll have a chance to hear a little bit more about the campaign ways you can get involved and ways you can lead this in your community. So we're really excited that this be a session where you come away with tools and next steps for engagement. Um, it's fantastic seeing all your answers on Mentimeter. Um, they've just disappeared from the screen, but some of the ones that had really jumped out to me, you know, intergenerational equity, power sharing, accountability, and then actually, it also a lot of talk about anti-oppression. You know, what does it mean to come into this space, to be safe, to be safe, to be leading it, and to be really making a difference? And the importance of really, you know, I guess adult-led organizations uh, and adult stakeholders sometimes taking a step back to allow us in as well. So there's some really great food for thought there. And I think some of these things are really going to come up as we move forward into conversation with our different speakers and hear a bit more about you know, their experiences of driving some of this work on the ground, whether that's as researchers, as advocates, as implementers. So yeah, really excited to see how we can start to respond to some of what you've already raised. So from MGCY's perspective, you know, we're, we've been a partner of this campaign for some time now, um, and we think it's really exciting. We think it's a moment to make a difference for young people. And I really want to encourage you all to, you know, check out the website, 
sign up for the updates and start to organize your own events and activities around this 1.8 campaign. It's a huge opportunity not to just advance someone else's agenda, but to advance our collective agenda as young people and to connect it with some of the goals you have, you know, whether you're working at grassroots communities, whether you're advocating for national change, um, and then being able to connect it to that bigger movement. And this is really important because one of the themes that you will hear about probably over the next few days in Ecos.U Forum as well is we're running out of time to achieve the SDGs. This is a big agenda that we said, look, we are going to change the world by 2030. But have we got there? We're halfway through. We're nowhere near. Um, and, you know, I think there is a glowing, growing recognition of this at the global level. Um, you know, the pandemic has set us back in many regards. But there are also vulnerabilities and failures really to, to embrace this agenda and to be bold and progressive to move it forward. So this year, the SDG Summit is going to happen at the UN in September. Uh, and next year, we also have the UN Summit of the Future. And these aim to accelerate action on the SDGs and start to forge a new global consensus on what our future should look like. But it's really critical that we as young people are at the forefront of this conversation to make sure that the SDGs, and whatever comes next after the SDGs, really deliver for our generation and for future generations. It's important to listen to them and to understand their challenges. It's about our views, our voices, and those things need to lead the way. And when we think about who is being left behind, um, there are many communities of, of young people and others who are at risk of being left behind. And today we're going to talk a little bit about women and girls, particularly in low and middle income countries, who some people say are already facing a shadow pandemic. They're experiencing higher rates of sexual violence, child marriage and teenage pregnancy, as well as differential access to services and increasing restrictions on their bodies, on their reproductive rights. So our first speaker is going to talk a little bit more about this, because being able to access sex and reproductive health services safely is more important than ever, particularly for us as young people trying to, you know, make informed choices about our lives and our future. But very little is known about actually how young people make those journeys to services and what kind of barriers they might experience. And that's why the FIA Foundation and Girl Effect, who we're going to hear from shortly, work together to develop a picture of girls' mobility experiences in their new report, the Mobility Matters. And this report has a really explicit focus on, you know, what is the available transport? What is the accessibility of transport? And what does this mean in terms of safety for young people in trying to access services in a range of locations across Nigeria, Malawi, Tanzania, and Rwanda? And the report has identified some really key issues. For example, you know, rising and inconsistent pricing of transport, sexual harassment and violence, and actually poor or dangerous transport infrastructure, which are really pronounced barriers, particularly for young mothers, for girls living with disabilities and other more marginalized communities. While this isn't the only challenge in accessing SRHL services, and it may not be the first one that comes to your mind, actually, when we talk about SRHL, you know, the evidence from this study is showing that it's a really important one. The report and the girls who are responding to the research are recommending a range of actions to deliver affordable, inclusive and sustainable transport systems, led by and focused on women and young girls to deliver meaningful change. So before we kick off the panel and we learn a bit more about this, I'm happy to share with you a video um, which highly sort of shares and directly features the voices and priorities from girls who participated in the development. And they will tell you a little bit about, you know, what they face on their journey to health summit. Um, and what barriers and opportunities that presents when they're trying to claim their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Over to David Gomez to share. around 7.40 a.m. in the morning and I'm heading out. 
ngobu ubwato ko bumeze ngiye kubusanganira hanyuma mwicaremo especially when you are dressed up so it makes you uncomfortable especially men and katika Mina sobe no kumkolo wa wifi forty ba mimi nipo pande pote zana ndi ndi tukwenda tukazo kwa sio. Pero hicho hicho ni na kuzo wenda mowuri tio hano imfuri kunda kuba no leo ni na abari muzira zima ziri mo ibshwango ziba ni le urumba kugare ibigeza wigo taru chira. Amagaramire <laughs> Analipa shiringi F1 Anashukua kwa hospitali Au kwa anayipanda daladala ni anasake tumi atano Ni hivyo Na katika kukutumia ina maana Magari anakuwa machache Abiria anakuwa wengi Na hiyo inasabisha watu kusimama kuni magari na katika kusimama katika magari mmeza mkakanya gana ah ho sakana gahanda mbona kwa natee no bwoba kujamo kujya ari nka ninjoro wenda oye ni kibazo ako bya byoroshye wenyine nagwanye nuko kose hegere ya mahoteli kana mali ndubona kujana ukiwa na araka kwa sababu na kwa niacha kitu mbani si dema kila mtu wale wenyewe ni kujana yetu kwa sababu ile mtu ni mwacha but here in this community, if there will be a special kitchen at there for girls, for girls movement, I think it should be more better, more accessible. Here is the health facility, even the health facility, I think it needs it need, um, some renovation for better services. Wonderful. So that sets the scene really nicely for our next segment, which is a panel discussion. Um, so we have three amazing panelists who are joining us to really set the scene and to reflect on what it means to meaningfully engage adolescents and young people in the SDGs. First, we have Gertrude Tsai, who's the lead researcher and report author for Girl Effect. Uh, so she led on the, the report that was the basis for the video you just saw. We also have Yakmo, who is a national gender youth advocate with UN Women, and I know she does absolutely amazing work. Um, and also Maggie from the UN Youth Association of Albania and ISEC Albania, and again, an amazing, another amazing youth advocate who is here to share her reflections with us today. So I'm just going to start by introducing Gertrude. So uh, Gertrude works with Girl Effect. Uh, which is an international NGO creating behavior change content to help adolescent girls in Africa and Asia take control of their health, their education, and their livelihood. 
And they really focus on youth generated insights um, about girls' lives, which are really central to the design of their programs and initiatives. Gertrude is the lead author on Girl Effect's latest research study, which was done in partnership with Fear Foundation. Uh, we're looking at the mobility experiences of adolescent girls and young women to sexual health clinics, as you just heard a little bit about, and brings a wealth of experience in leading research uh, with national organizations and international organizations. So thank you so much, Gertrude, for joining us to discuss a bit more about the report, um, where it came from, what it tells us, um, and maybe some reflections as well on, on what you really learned through, through doing this report. So over to you, Gertrude. Thank you so much, Lucy, and thank you for having me today to talk about this report. Um, it's really hot off the press, it only came out yesterday, and as you've seen from the video, it kind of highlights some of the kind of barriers and issues facing young girls in those four geographies when travelling to access SRH services. So in terms of the wider global context, unfortunately, young people still remain a neglected group to transport infrastructure planning and transport networks are vital and the importance of it is directly recognized in SDG 11, um, specifically provide access to safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems with special attention to the needs of those in vulnerable situations. So as part of the study, we conducted a thorough literature review and unfortunately there are several barriers that impact adolescent girls and young women's mobility and unfortunately there is even more a dearth of research in this area when considering young mothers and girls with disabilities. Um, my colleague Callie has put a link to the report in the chat and I really employ everyone to try and read it um, but as far as not giving away too many headlines I just wanted to give a kind of brief overview of the report. So its main objective is examining the specific enablers and challenges that adolescent girls and young women face in their journey to access SRH services. And as uh, mentioned before, FIA and Girl Effect identified this kind of gap in research and really trying to plug that in with this kind of method. Um, in terms of the methodology, we used um, its main kind of, um, method is peer research and I'm so glad to see from the Mentimeter that um, people have been talking about participatory research and peer research because it's so important in getting young people's voices heard but in terms of more information about TEGA so it stands for um, Technology Enabled Girls Ambassadors and that's essentially a network of adolescent girls and young women aged 18 to 24 trained in qualitative research methods capturing data in mixed media format so audio so Survey and as we've seen, kind of ethnographic video to develop a picture of girls' mobility experiences. So we did conduct individual interviews with over 200 adolescent girls and young women aged 15 to 19, with a subgroup of girls with disabilities and young mothers as well. Um, alongside that, we also had interviews with experts, with expertise across transport, climate change, exploring the intersections with gender and SRHR. So just to go into those barriers in a bit more detail, we found it to be rather consistent across the four geographies, mainly around pricing, uh, specifically inconsistent pricing structure and high transport costs. So that included arbitrary pricing um, by vehicle operators during COVID. Unfortunately, as we know, there were social distancing um, restrictions and therefore vehicle operators in order to kind of recoup that cost had high um, transport costs. However, now that the removal of social distancing has been in place for a while, unfortunately, as told by the girls in our study, these high prices still remain. Alongside that, there's also the threat of harassment and physical violence. Um, as we saw in the video, there are concerns around name calling and transit during dark and desolate areas. A lot of the roads aren't necessarily well lit or have security personnel and therefore can make these journeys quite dangerous for some girls and therefore off-putting to go to these sexual health clinics. Alongside this, there are also social barriers, so discriminatory social norms, um, forcing girls to withhold their final destination for fear of being judged as well by the members of their family or community or wider social network. But 
the thing that came up uh, alongside costs in particular was around the support transport infrastructure. So the high number of road collisions involving young people, girls with disabilities, particularly physical ailments, feeling discriminated against, and buses not always accessible, and a lack of provision for those traveling with children. So again, when you consider all of these kind of barriers, some are really acute and specific to SRH clinics. So for instance, in Malawi, for instance, that only 30% of the road is paved and a lot of the bad road conditions, unfortunately, are roads leading to SRH clinics. So making it really difficult for girls to kind of make those journeys safely. There were some examples of enablers, so traveling as a group for security purposes and keeping the numbers of named drivers handy. But unfortunately, the kind of macro level barriers around the poor transport and road infrastructure, namely the lack of inconsistent incon pricing, will present as a bar barrier regardless of the service being accessed. Um, and then community level, it is around those kind of discriminatory social norms. And so as part of the study, we also ask girls to provide recommendations because, of course, they know better. They're doing these journeys. Of course, they're able to kind of articulate what they kind of need. Um, and some recommendations include like confidence building and family negotiation skills for SRHR and services access to help navigate these social norms um, and establishing strong NGO connections um, on these areas so that girls feel they might feel empowered, but there are these barriers around them so it's enabling those girls to feel kind of safe in their community it kind of speaks to one of the pillars of the 1.8 billion campaign around resilience and safety so until those issues are addressed um, the journeys can will still forever be difficult not just for girls but for the communities more widely thank you so much Gertrude and I was really struck actually by how you mentioned about the importance of the work you're doing in involving girls in the research not just as study participants but actually as you know shapers as co-researchers in, in leading that work and you know just sort of reflecting on what you said about the report you know I can see it's been really helpful in surfacing some of the challenges that young girls face in relation to mobility and transport services you know, things that things that often don't get talked about or highlighted, but are really intrinsic to, to young people's experiences in their day to day lives. Um, and really interesting to see how research has kind of been this sort of important opener up of that conversation, so to speak. Um, and one thing we often hear from young people, those of us in youth movements, is, you know, research about young people is often done without young people. Um, and, you know, it can either feel maybe a little bit extractive or it doesn't feel like it's really getting to the heart of the issues that, that we know are, are really important. So building on your experiences and the great work that you've been doing, you know, where do you see those opportunities for us to really cultivate um, those ways in which adolescents and young people can become more active participants in research processes to address some of these gaps and also to to surface issues which may be priorities for them but haven't necessarily got that same traction in the academic community at the moment? That's such an important question um, and I think particularly peer research and participatory research is a growing area um, within research methods although it still remains a niche area not only but especially in the global north but particularly acute in the global south as well um, and I'm sure many of us whether or not it's our age or when we were younger, there's just certain topics that we would feel more comfortable speaking about with our peers. Um, but again, it needs to be within an environment that does feel safe, that does feel like our voice and um, is being heard, and therefore our social network isn't going to judge us for certain things as well. And the few studies that have these peer research methods highlight the potential rewards of such collaborations and the possibility of negotiating, albeit in small ways, improve routes to local understanding understanding and trust building. Um, but the rewards kind of extend beyond individual peer researchers to their wider communities, to the academic research policy, and in the long term can lead to better policy and practice. So concerning our study, we did have the peer research element, both as a data collection method, but also we conducted validation workshops with experts as well, as a way to triangulate findings and make sure they're all findings are consistent. Um, so again, that was another way that we can involve girls and young people in the research process. Peer research and participatory research is not just about just like 
giving ownership to research of young people, although that can be um, another example of how you can involve young people in the process. But there are like little things and different ways that you can involve young people in the research process that allows their voices to be heard. Another example is currently in progress is a Girls and Mobile 2.0 report by Girl Effect that will be released in the summer. And that includes a youth advisory panel, which is two representatives across 14 countries of young people and again is another um, example of how young people can be included in the research and recognizing the importance of having their views embedded across each stage of the research process, including research design, implementation and reporting. And so it is important, particularly when I think about the validation workshops we did for this mobility study, is that they need to be in the room with thought leaders. It's not just a case of young people just being in a room amongst themselves talking about really sensitive topics in order for their voices to be amplified and heard they need to be in a room with influential decision makers and that way that's how you can empower them and hopefully be active participants in the change needed in their community and hopefully more globally great thanks Gertrude I love that I feel like we could have a whole session around you know young people's voices and research. <laughs> maybe watch this space this might become a series <laughs> But for now, I'm going to have to go on to our next panelist. So I'm really excited that we're being joined in this session today um, by Yagma, who is a UN uh, Women National Gender Youth Advocate, uh, founder of an organization called Calisto Youth, as well as being an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto. And I know she's just traveled into New York for the Ecosoc Youth Forum. Um, so we're really grateful that she's able to join us online today to talk a little bit about her experiences and insights um, as a youth advocate. And Yagma, I just want to maybe open up the conversation um, by really asking you some reflections I was having, you know, when we were hearing from our first speaker, you know, given the evidence in the Gal Effect study that talks about really how important um, issues like transport and mobility can be, in trying to access you know, vital health provision, things that are really important for young people. How do you think you know, that youth groups and youth movements can best organize to influence very specific policy issues? You know, do you have any experiences that you would like to reflect on from your experiences mobilizing on issues locally? And how do we find ways of really building our movements to try and raise the visibility but also to create change on the things that as young people we see affecting our lives. So over to you, Yagma, I'd really love to hear from you on that. Thank you, Lucy. Mobilizing on specific policy issues requires a strategic and collaborative approach among youth networks and key stakeholders in the governments and civil society organizations. It is critical to build strong coalitions, develop clear and compelling messages, and utilize a range of advocacy tactics, as well as ensure you are using media effectively and responsibly to advocate for your cause. In terms of experiences mobilizing on such issues locally, Youth groups have been successfully in advocating for policy changes by leveraging their collective power and utilizing creative advocacy tactics. For example, in some communities, youth groups have organized bike rides to highlight lack of transportation options for low-income individuals and communities. In other cases, they have been they have used social media campaigns and petitions to uh, pressure elected officials to allocate funding for improved transportation infrastructure and services. Since young people can use technological devices very comfortably and effectively, they can easily use social media to make their voices heard and take action. When it reaches more people on social media, it really has an impact on decision-making mechanisms. That's why we make our voices heard on social media to get political and financial support in projects. And that's how we mostly succeed. The COVID-19 pandemic is a perfect example of how the power of young people can be leveraged to increase and ensure access to health services, while also highlighting gaps in health systems that must be addressed by those in power. However, while we are speaking about the ability of youth to organize themselves to influence policy decisions, it is also critical to acknowledge that young people need safe uh, spaces and a, a seat at the table to share their thoughts, opinions, and perspectives. All policies 
especially those that impact the well-being of young people, must be anchored in meaningful engagements of young people to empower them and enable them to be the change they want to see. Great, thanks so much, uh, Yaku. And I, yeah, I've been really privileged to see the work that you've done, not only at the local level, but in these international policy spaces, like the UN uh, Generation Equality Process, where, you know, I think there have been real struggles for young people to, to voice out their perspectives and create change in the ways we wanted. And we had to build our own communities, our own solidarity to be a little bit creative, find ways of, you know, building some of those unlikely alliances to get our points through. Um, and I think that's been a really, you know, incredible process in the sense that it, it's shown the way young people can really bring that power through our creativity, through our flexibility, and sometimes by just being very, very persistent um, on the issues that matter most to us. So, I've got a follow-up question, and I really wanted to bring this back a little bit to the Global Forum on Adolescence now. So we talked at the beginning of the session about the Global Forum for Adolescence as this big milestone event coming up later this year, um, as well as the 1.8 billion campaign um, to really highlight the voices of young people on the issues that affect. So just drawing on your own reflections here, you know, how can the Global Forum for Adolescence you know, begin to drive action on these issues for young people, particularly some of the ones that maybe are affecting youth in your community. And how can we further use this space? So not just taking one moment, but seeing this as an enabler of the next moment to really strengthen the voices and leadership of adolescents and to make sure that they can be really reflected and participating actively in decision-making processes at all levels. I'd love to just hear some reflections you maybe have on that. Yeah, of course, let's see. <clears throat> the Global Forum for Adolescents can play a crucial role in the driving action on issues that are important to young people in communities around the world. It is refreshing to see that this is not just a campaign for youth people, but is also be why young people, which means that issues that affect young people that most at the global and national levels will take center stage. The forum should amplify youth voices, the forum can provide a platform for young people to share their experiences and perspectives on issues that matter to them. As David mentioned, young people have the opportunity to, and must use the platform to organize virtual and in-person events, create online forums for discussion, and use social media to share what they would like to see for their well-being. Facilitate collaboration. The forum can facilitate collaboration between young people, organizations, and decision makers to address the challenges facing adolescents and young people at global, regional, and national levels. Advocate for policy change. The forum can advocate for policy change that promotes the rights and well being of young people. This can include supporting youth led campaigns for policy change, engaging with policymakers at a local and national levels, and promoting the participation of young people in the decision making process. To further strengthen adolescent leadership and participation in the decision making process at all levels, the forum must ensure that young people are not only on only the focus, but also the spokespeople for the issues they fact. The forum and all events that lead up to it must provide policymakers and decision makers and insights into the challenges young people have been facing prior to COVID-19 and ones which have been uh, exacerbated after the pandemic. The forum must be used as a platform to inspire future actions and chart uh, out tangible next steps as it relates to the issues of adolescents and young people. Additionally, and most importantly, the forum should serve as an example of meaningful adolescent and youth engagements, one which supported young people in their end of the door to act, inspire, and engage. Overall, the Global Forum for Adolescents can play a critical role in driving action on issues that are important to young people and promoting greater adolescent leadership and participation in the decision making process. Great, thank you so much. I think those are really great insights into the way that we can make the Global Forum of Adolescents work for us as young people. You know, this shouldn't be something that's just being led by adult organizations to try and say, what, what do young people want? What commitments do we you know, want for young people? But actually, we as a community should be stepping up and saying, these are the things we want. How are you going to meet us 
How are you going to respond to this? And how are you going to commit to take action? Um, so I think, yeah, that's a really great insight and something I'd love us to be able to unpack a little bit further. Um, so we have our final panelist, uh, Maggie, who is a member of the UN Youth Association of Albania um, and also IFEC Albania. She's a scholar, she's a hydrotechnical engineer who's currently finishing her master's in a science degree. Um, and we actually met online a few weeks ago at the UNECE uh, Regional Forum for Sustainable Development. So it's amazing to have the opportunity to connect with you once again, Maggie. It was really wonderful to connect with you again as well. I'm really thankful to be part of this panel and happy to meet everybody that has participated here. Great, thanks so much, Maggie. Um, don't mind us, everyone. We're just having a reconnection moment online. Um, but I'm very conscious of time, so I'm going to jump straight into the questions. Uh, and I think one thing that has really, you know, been on my mind as we talk about 1.8 billion young people, right, is that 1.8 is a large one. And we know that young people are not all the same. You know, that number encompasses a really large and varied group of young people with different realities, different contexts, different issues. Um, so how do we ensure that those young people who want to be advocates, who want to be advocates, are not like And how do yeah. we include young people who aren't all that? So, you know, young people with disabilities or adolescent mothers, so that their voices can be um, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yes, uh, it is very important that we do not leave advocates and activists behind, especially those who are may face additional challenges in being heard. Ensuring that all young people, including those with disabilities or adolescent mothers are included is critical to creating a truly inclusive and equitable society. Um, we need to ensure that young people are recognized and engaged in all their diversity, including differences in gender, ethnicity, ability, socioeconomic status, and other factors. This means ensuring that advocacy and activism efforts are inclusive and accessible to all young people. In addition, like we have mentioned in the discussions before, it is critical to ensure that young people, especially those with disabilities or adolescent mothers, have a platform for engagement that is safe and accessible and one which accommodates their needs. Young people with disabilities or adolescent mothers may, have, may face unique challenges that need to be addressed in order for them to participate fully in advocacy and activism. Providing targeted support, such as childcare services, transportation, financial assistance, or accommodations for specific disabilities can help remove barriers to participation. Providing materials in accessible formats, such as braille, audio, and easy to read languages. Additionally, events that meetings uh, and meetings should be held in accessible locations and accommodations should be made to ensure that everyone can fully participate. Working in partnership with organizations that represent young people with disabilities or adolescent mothers is just as important. This will amplify their voices, increase their visibility and ensure that their needs and perspectives are well represented in their advocacy efforts. Raising visibility of lived experiences and challenges div diverse group of young people go through is also necessary to ensure these spaces are created for them for meaningful engagement. We must discard the one shoe fits all approach and ensure we are as inclusive as possible. This will ensure that these groups have the opportunity to speak out, share their stories and perspectives and promote their leadership in decision-making processes. Overall, we must Intention must be intentional in our engagement with diverse groups of young people, ensuring we are catering to their needs and empowering them to be part of the process. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. And then I'm conscious we don't have that much time, so I'm going to ask you uh, for a final remark on something that probably is the, the key takeaway for today. Um, you know, the Global Forum for Adolescent Campaign they're all presenting a moment for young people to have their voices heard on this matter and to highlight what's most important to them. You know, given your experience in advocacy, the moments and movements you've been involved in, what's your advice to the young people who want to participate in a global forum in order that they can make the best use of this opportunity and have their voices heard? 
The Global Forum for Adolescents is definitely a milestone moment, one which has a potential to define ways in which young people can contribute to the future of well-being of adolescents and youth globally and nationally. Uh, it is dedicated to empowering and elevating the voices of young people around the world and aims to ensure that the needs and the rights of young people are addressed in global policies and programs. So as a young woman, I would encourage all young people to, at first step, join the movement and make their own, take ownership and use the resources being provided to the best of your ability. You have the chance not only to raise the visibility of issues you are working on, but also share why this issue is important and why it needs the attention of policymakers and decision, decision makers on this platform. You must have a clear idea on what you are trying to achieve and identify clear issues and challenges you would like to highlight. Leverage the reach and network of the campaign to find like-minded young people and organizations that are working on the same issues, same vision and mission. Build alliances with the other young people, civil society organization and other stakeholders who share your goals and can support your efforts. Use these opportunities provided by the campaign and forum to speak out on social media while highlighting issues to care for, become an enabler and encourage other adolescents and young people to speak out, share and engage with the campaign, share stories of change and leadership of young people you think deserve to be highlighted in the globally and regionally and internationally. You will be able to participate in policy discussions and influence global agendas related to sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender equality, education, and other critical issues. Last but not least, ensure you are making your voice count by engaging with young people as you want. You must know that your voice, opinion, and perspectives is essential. Use your voice and don't be afraid to speak up and take action. Young people are the present and they are definitely the future and the forum is an opportunity for us to ensure we are defining what our future looks like. Great, thank you so much Maggie. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I know some of them have said that they have to, to respond there and give you some you know thoughts and reflections from their side. Um, but I wanted to actually take this moment uh, to introduce our guest who has joined us for some closing remarks. She's been listening in to everything that's been said. Um, and I think we're really privileged to have her with us. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Zoya Ali Rizki, who is the Deputy Commissioner for Adolescent Health at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for the Government of India. So a very important policymaker who's been listening in to us and really thinking about how she can play a role um, in amplifying the voices and leadership of the athletes. So thank you so much, Dr. Zoya, for joining us. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. So I'd love to hear a little bit from you about how do you see this agenda for adolescent wellbeing accelerating progress towards the SDGs? And what action do you think that leaders can take now to support this? We'd love to hear your remarks before we end up closing this event, because I think that policymaker perspective is so important on these issues. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lucy, for this opportunity and to all the speakers for their insights, which I've been listening into. Um, you're aware that there are 1.8 billion adolescent and youth in the world today. And with the latest estimates, maximum number of these young people reside in India. We have through our discussions right now, not only established that the global pandemic has set this generation back, but also established the need to invest in the well-being of adolescent and youth while including them in the process of decision-making for a better and brighter future. We need to remember the issue of adolescent well-being cannot be addressed in silos. It is multi-sectoral in nature. Without investment in and prioritization of this population group, we cannot hope to achieve the SDGs. I believe that the agenda for adolescent well-being has the potential to accelerate progress towards achieving the SDGs in several ways. First, investing in adolescent well-being can have a positive impact on the health outcomes, particularly with regards to maternal and child health. Improving access to sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents can contribute to reducing maternal and infant mortality rates, which are the key indicators for SDG 3, you're well aware, good health and well-being. Focusing on adolescent well-being can help to address the issue of gender inequality, which is a cross-cutting theme across all SDGs. Empowering adolescent girls by providing them with education and health services can help empower young girls 
enabling them to reach their full potential and contribute positively to their nations. Investing in adolescent well-being can contribute to economic growth and poverty reduction. Adolescents are the workforce of today, tomorrow, and ensuring that they are healthy and well-educated will enable them to contribute effectively to the economy and thereby reduce the poverty rates. Researchers have estimated that the returns of between $5 to $10 for every $1 invested in selected interventions to promote the adolescent well-being are common, with the ratios well above 10 for many of the interventions. Next, concerted multi-sectoral investment and action for well-being of young people is the need of the hour, and leaders must take and inspire action for this population right now. The Government of India has been a pioneer in adolescent health and well-being space and has been tailoring policy and programs to the needs of adolescent and youth for several years now. Additionally, being the current G20 president has been leveraged by our leaders to showcase why and how adolescent and youth must be empowered and how this huge demographic dividend can be benefits for many years to come for our country. Leaders, leaders championing the cause, especially as a part of 1.8 campaign and the forum, are in a unique position to purposefully connect partners and facilitate dialogue for commitment to adolescent well-being to accelerate the progress toward the SDGs. This has an immense potential for carrying on even after the forum concludes. As leaders, partners, and staunch advocates for adolescent well-being, we must work towards ensuring that we all use every opportunity to advocate for the well-being of adolescent and youth, not only from a lens of achieving the SDGs, but to ensure that we build a brighter, healthier, and more equitable future for us all. Thank you. I think it's Lucy online. Hi, everyone. Oh, the internet for Lucy just dropped. OK, <laughs> yeah, fine. But I'm really happy to wrap up the event as we are waiting for Lucy to come back. David, would you like to pick it up? Or otherwise, I will wrap it up. No, uh, yeah, I can go ahead and, uh, and wrap up the, the session. I just wanted to thank Soya first, of course, as usual, for your awesome intervention and for the government of India support for the 1.8 billion uh, campaign and the GFA and, and, and so on. I can go on and on. Uh, but um, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to take the chance to, to say that. But I see that Lucy is back online, so I'll hand it over to you, Lucy, for closing the session. I look forward to having you here in India. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David, also for stepping in while I had a very brief technical failure. That's what uh, solidarity is really all about. Um, and thank you so much, Jaya, for, for your remarks and also for your leadership, I think, on this agenda. It's been, you know, I think for me as a young person as well, really reinvigorating to know that there are leaders out there who are standing with us and have so much passion for this work. So, you know, we look forward to that continued collaboration as well over the coming months and even beyond the global forum, because this is just one step on the way. So thank you so much to everybody for staying with us, for listening, for sharing your ideas. I've also seen um, some amazing connections already happening in the chat. So people exchanging contact information, uh, connecting, which is really fantastic. Um, and so I just wanted to finish off by saying, where do we go from here? Because as a young person, that's what I always want to know <laughs> at the end of anything like this. Um, so we want you to join this campaign, join this movement, um, and be part of the Global Forum for Adolescents. One of the things that we can do after this call is we will share the partner engagement kit with you, which provides some really useful tools and resources um, so that you can take this campaign, you can localize it in your community, but also so that we can amplify your efforts as a young person um, as well. And one of the things that we've just done is we shared on the screen a, a final Mentimeter poll for today. Um, and we'd love you to share, you know, what kind of action are you inspired to take now coming out of this meeting? Do you want to spread the word on social media? 
maybe organize an event with adolescents and young people in your community, um, you know, maybe share some ideas, organize a session, um, get in touch with your commitment makers, your leaders, your policy makers, and tell them what you want and what that collaboration can look like uh, in the spirit of intergenerational equality and equity. Um, and yeah, exciting. I see lots of you already thinking about what kind of action you can take. Um, and for me, I actually have one thing that I really want to give a shout out to before the end of the session, all the young people here. So this Friday, we're having our next mobilizer training for the, the 1.8 billion young people. Um, and this is a really a skill building, capacity building session for young people so that you can go out and lead a campaign in your community. You can take and consult and engage with other young people to think about what do they want? What are their messages? How can you really be an amplifier for their priorities and demands? So that's happening this Friday, I believe. Um, and my colleague has just shared the link in the chat. So please do sign up, come along, find out how you can lead this campaign. Um, and even if you're not able to join in person, um, please do register because we'll be able to share the materials with you um, and give you details of some of the next mobilizer trainings as well. And then finally, we still have an open expression of interest for the Global Forum on Adolescence. Um, so you can apply to host a slide event or a session. Um, and I think my colleague Bavia is sending many links in the chat. So please do check it out um, and see if that's something that you as a youth leader or the organizations you work with will be interested in running a session um, to really advance the agenda on adolescent and young people's health and well-being. Um, and yeah, India hosting a day-long event on young people on June 20th, so we'll say keep an eye out for that. Brilliant. Well, thank you all so much. It's been fantastic. And let's keep this energy high. I hope to see many of you in other EcoSoc Youth Forum events in the next couple of days. See some of you at the Global um, Forum training on Friday. And please do stay in touch. Keep this momentum going. You are what part of the 1.8. Um, and we can't wait for you to be able to speak up and be heard in this campaign. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of the day.